Good morning, church. We're so glad you're here. Will you stand with us? And let's sing. What holds your heart? What stirs your soul? What matters come to mind? The cares you keep, the thoughts you think, oh, it's not a wasted time. Seeking you will find joy still comes in. The child inside that we left for growing you're here today. Go ahead and have a seat and let's all watch this together. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship at Bear Valley Church. My name's Kyle. I'm the youth pastor here, and I want to let you know about a couple of things as our service gets started. If you're joining us here in person, open up the bulletin you got on your way in and take a look inside. One thing you'll see is this communication card. We would love for you to fill this out just to let us know that you're here. And on the back, you can let us know how we can be praying for you this week. You can fill out this card now and drop it in the container on your way out the door at the end of the service. 
If you're joining us online, you can fill out the same card at bearvalleychurch.com slash connect. Also in your bulletin, you'll see some announcements about upcoming events. Be sure to stick around after the message and hear some more about the awesome stuff we have coming up in the life of our church. That's all we've got for right now. Let's continue in worship. Will you stand with us and let's sing together. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now and in the waiting. The same God that's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. 
Father, this morning we come and we sing songs about how good you are, about how we want to devote our lives to you and focus on you for all of our days. So this morning we pray that those are not just words that we're singing, but intentions of our heart, so that as you teach us to become more and more like you, to give you glory in all that we do, and to love people the way that you love people for all of our days, we'll give you glory and worship you in Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. The absolute basics of the Christian faith. Who is God? The Trinity is one of the most important theological ideas ever, but it gives people panic attacks when they think about it. So this chapter will give you the building blocks you need to understand what the Trinity is and why it matters so much. God is three persons who have existed for all eternity, are all equally powerful, wise, and good, and have always depended on each other. There's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit existing in perfect harmony as one God. So how can this be? How can you have three things that exist perfectly together as one? Well, here's the thing. If you can understand a tiny bit about how music works, you can understand the basics of the Trinity. So find a piano, pick any white key, and put your thumb on it, then skip a white key and put your index finger on the next one, then skip one more and put your middle finger on the next white key. Now press down your thumb, index finger, and middle finger, and boom, there's a harmonic chord. Three distinct sounds, all existing in a perfect harmony. Three things that are also one thing. The threeness and the oneness work perfectly together. This gives us a picture, rather a sound, of what God is like. There is one God, like the one chord, with three persons, like three notes, all existing in perfect harmony forever. So unlike the chord, which we just played, which came into being, then ceased to exist, the three persons of the Trinity have always existed. They've always existed in the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father has always been Father to the Son. He can't be a Father without a Son. The Son has always been Son to the Father, and they've always been unified by the love of the Spirit. 
But this means that the most basic fact of all reality is loving relationship. Before there was a world, there was a family. The family of the Triune God. So when you get down to the very bottom of things, to the root of all reality, there's love. C.S. Lewis makes this interesting point in Mere Christianity. He writes, All sorts of people are fond of repeating the Christian statement that God is love, but they seem not to notice that the words God is love have no real meaning unless God contains at least two persons. Love is something that one person has for another person. If God was a single person, then before the world was made, he was not love. So the fact that God is perfectly loving requires that God is relational. And the opposite is also true. The fact that God is relational requires that God is perfectly loving. And here's why. If God is triune, we know that God is love because you can't have three people existing for all eternity in harmonious relationship if they aren't perfectly loving. Imagine existing for all eternity with your brothers and sisters, or even your friends. Eventually you get into some fights. But the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they don't fight. We know that God is love because God is a trinity. And we know that God is a trinity because God is love. So the trinity is this perfect loving relationship that's always existed. One God and three persons. And because the trinity is one God, the persons work together in everything they do. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says we are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The entire Trinity is at work in saving us, so we must name the whole Trinity as we're made part of Christ's body through baptism. And it's not just baptism. All throughout the story of Jesus, we see all three persons at work. There's a pattern here. The Father is the source of everything, and he sends the Son to the world in the power of the Spirit. We see this in Jesus' birth. By the Holy Spirit, the Son of God is born to the world. We see this in Jesus' baptism. The Son carries out the mission of the Father in the power of the Spirit. And we see this in Jesus' blessing his disciples when he ascends. When the Son goes back to the Father, he sends the Spirit to empower us. Did you detect the pattern? Here it is again. The Father is the source and goal of our salvation. Jesus is the way, and the Holy Spirit is the power to get there. Imagine it a bit like this. The Father is the one who says, let there be light. And the sun goes and flips on the light switch. And the spirit is the electricity that powers the light bulb. The Father is the source, the Son is the way, and the Holy Spirit is the power. Another way of thinking about this is to imagine yourself kneeling and praying the Lord's Prayer. We're praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Now imagine Jesus is standing beside you. And so we begin by praying our Father, and immediately we see that Jesus is helping us to have right relationship with his Father. Now also imagine as the Holy Spirit inside you who is giving you the power to pray the prayer Jesus taught us. The Son beside you, the Father above you, the Spirit inside you, all working to give us a right relationship with God. All this might seem a bit mysterious and complicated, but the nice thing is that once you start looking for the Trinity, you see it everywhere. For instance, the very words of the Apostles' Creed are shaped by the Trinity. We begin with the Father, the Source, move to the Son, the Way, and end with the Spirit, the Spirit's area of work empowering the Church. The Father above you, Jesus beside you, the Spirit inside you. There you go. There's the Trinity. Well, we're in this new series called Trinity. Today we're looking at the work of the Holy Spirit. And um, on Thursday, we just got our team just got back from Wales. We had a wonderful experience there. Um, we had an awesome time setting up our partnership with the town of Tongwynlais. And that is T-O-N-G-W-Y-N-L-A-I-S, <coughs> which means the, the field of the Gwynlais family. And uh, the church there was, was just awesome. The church was actually started in 1827. They've had their ups and downs. There were about 60 people there um, uh, on Sunday morning. And uh, just the sweetest group of people ever. We had such an awesome time. So over the next couple of weeks, we'll be talking with them about some specific dates and things like that for when we can come back over and continue our partnership. That church has been um, kind of on COVID lockdown for the last two years. They're finally meeting in their facility. And um, the, um, our missionary, uh, Marianne Smith, who has been over there since September, kind of set the stage for us. So they, they all felt like they knew us by the time we get there. And our partnership there is because they live in an area where only about 2% of the population attends church. And so they are asking for an American church partnership just to help out and to try to move things forward. Now, the kids made a little, uh, the kids there made a little video for us to say goodbye, so I wanted you to see that. 
Oh, hi, American team. Thank you for being so kind for us, and thank you for coming to Wales, and I hope you have a good trip home. Bye. 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 <laughs> okay, so you can see how much fun we had there. Now, we're in this series on Trinity, looking at the Holy Spirit. The Father created, the Son saved, and the Holy Spirit then is now the advance power of the worldwide mission of God to bring the gospel to the world. Now, the disciples loved being with Jesus. They loved being with him every day. I mean, how wonderful must that have been? And so they were understandably upset when Jesus said he was going to be leaving. They're like, why are you leaving us? We want to be close to you. And what he wanted them to know is that when he left, he would leave his spirit to be with them, to walk with them, to share with them, to love them every step of the way, 24-7, with every believer in Jesus Christ from now and to the end of the world. Um, here's the way the Apostle Paul wrote about it later in Romans 8. And we're going to be looking at the things about the Holy Spirit from Romans 8 today. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The Spirit of Jesus. He walks with us through life. He leads us. He takes away our fear. And he lets us know that we're part of God's family, that we've been adopted into his family. Now, you may feel like you're not so familiar with the Holy Spirit. Maybe, you know, God, Jesus, but the Holy Spirit, that may be... You know, you may feel like you don't understand that quite as well. Well, here's the deal. You actually know him better than you think. Because if you know the Father, then you know the Spirit of the Father. If you know Jesus, then you know the Spirit of the Jesus. That is the Holy Spirit. There's one time in the New Testament when um, we see and experience physically the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that is at Jesus' baptism. So at Jesus' baptism, Jesus was there. And then the Holy Spirit landed on him like a dove. And then they actually heard the audible voice of God say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So um, we're going to look today at several points now from Romans chapter 8. And let's go ahead and look at point number one. So get out your bare notes and uh, let's begin to take a look at the various uh, ideas there about the Holy Spirit that we see in Romans 8. First of all, the Spirit leads us. Number one is that the Spirit leads us. I remember uh, being at a Christian conference one time, and I heard a guy say that he was sitting at the table at lunch in a restaurant, and he said, God told me to take my vacation money and give it to the guy three tables over. Okay, now the challenge with that is that when people hear that, they think, well, God never speaks to me like that. I must be some kind of second-class Christian. But the truth is that God speaks to people in a variety of ways. God spoke to Moses in a burning bush. God spoke to Balaam through his donkey. Okay? God spoke to Joseph in a dream. God spoke to disciples, like at his baptism, in an audible voice that they could hear from heaven. So God speaks to people in different ways, and, and we can just trust that God would speak to us in the way that he wants to speak to us. Here's what it says in Romans 8 about being led. Verse 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So the Holy Spirit leads all believers, but how? How does he lead us? There are some clear instructions in the New Testament about how the Holy Spirit leads us. And he, he may want to speak to you through a burning bush or through a donkey, although I don't know if any of you have a donkey, so I don't know how that would work. But anyway, but... There are some ways in which God speaks to all believers. And the first one of those is illumination. The word illumination. That is, God illumines the words of his scripture so that we can understand them and so that we can follow. You hear people say, well, God told me to take this job. Or God told me to make this decision. But they usually come to that conclusion after a long period of time thinking about it and evaluating, you know, which is right and which is wrong and which is left and which is right, that sort of thing. 
and trying to figure out the whole situation. And then it's sort of like after the fact, they finally realize, okay, this is what God wanted me to do. And they use that terminology, God told me to take this job. But, but usually it wasn't an audible voice or in a, in a burning bush. It was usually through a long period of decision-making that God helped them and that God illumined their minds and illumined the principles of Scripture to help them make a good decision. Um, in John 14, 25, and 26, it says, All this, this is Jesus, all this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, or the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I've said. The Holy Spirit will remind us and teach us about everything that is written down in God's Word. The Holy Spirit inspired writers to write the very words of God in this book so that we would have them. And now the Holy Spirit takes the, word, the written Word and illumines our minds so that we can understand it. And God went to great lengths to get all this written down. I mean, great lengths to get all this written down and to get it preserved for us so that we would have it today. Therefore, literacy is a big deal in Christianity because we want people to be able to read God's Word for themselves and to understand it for themselves because that's how the Holy Spirit illumines our minds is through the Word. And that's why 92% of the, of the first 138 universities that were started in America were started by Christians to train pastors and to train church leaders on how to read God's Word and to understand it. Um, now, I wanted to share a word about Martin Luther because I try to work, somehow work Martin Luther into every sermon. But anyway, um, so we learn the Word and we're led by the Spirit. Now, I want to read this from uh, this statement that Luther wrote. He said, I was 20 years old before I had ever seen the Bible. Can you believe that? I was 20 years old before I'd ever seen the Bible. And when he was 20, he was a monk, (laughs) okay? So he was a full-time church worker, and he had never seen a Bible before. He said... I had no notion that there existed any other scripture or gospels or epistles other than those that were quoted during the worship services. At last, I came across a Bible in the library at Erfurt. And so at Erfurt, at the monastery there, they had purchased some um, Latin Bibles at great expense, which were, it says, reluctantly shown to visitors. And Luther just happened on one in the library, and he opened it. And his eyes rested with inexpressible ecstasy on the story of Hannah and her son Samuel. And he said, my God, he said, I would seek no other wealth in the whole world than a copy of this book. But see, we have them now. We have the word now. Everybody's got one. You can get one free anywhere. We have the word now. And so our job now is to learn it. And let the Holy Spirit illuminate our minds so that we'll understand exactly what it's saying. That's the first thing, illumine. The second one is the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. How does God speak to us? He speaks to us through the concept of the mind of Christ. That's how he leads us. The more illumination takes place, the more we have the mind of Christ, and we can think like Jesus. The WWJD, what would Jesus do, concept, is great. It, the one thing that's kind of weird about it, it, it's like what would Jesus do sort of assumes that Jesus is not here, but he is here. But anyway, what would Jesus do? We already know a lot about what Jesus would do because it's all written down. We are, we've already understood it. We've been doing it all these years. We know what Jesus would do in most situations. And the more we walk with him, the more we will develop in our own brain, in our own heart, the mind of Christ. And we will know what Jesus does in every situation because the more we understand his word, the more we think like him. In 1 Corinthians 2, 12 and 16, it says, what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of the world 
who is from God so that we might understand what God has freely given us. But we have the mind of Christ. In many situations, we already know the right thing to do. We already know what God would do in that situation. We probably know 95% of everything that we're supposed to do on any given day. We already know we're supposed to go to work. We're supposed to eat. We're supposed to make decisions about honorably in our work environment, in our family environment, right? We already know like 95% of, of God's will in every situation. And if we will walk with him, and if we'll stay close to him, the Holy Spirit will help us with that other 5% that we don't know. I, I remember once I was um, praying about a decision, you know, should I go do this way or do this way? Should I uh, accept this or accept that? And um, I felt like as I was praying about that, I felt like God said to me, well, which one, what do you want to do? And I was like, no, God, I'm asking you, which one am I supposed to do? And, and I felt like he was saying, which one do you want to do? And it reminded me of that verse that says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, the concept there is, as you delight yourself in the Lord, as you love the Lord, as you walk with the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart because you will become more and more like him and the desires of your heart would be the same desires as Jesus because you're getting to be like him. And so I felt like God was saying, um, just do the thing that you know is, is the right thing. And, and, it, and it, it's, that's the one because you already know enough about Jesus to know the right thing to do. Um, let's look on the on page two because there's a little more I want to share with you about this concept um, related to how do you test your impressions. See, one of the important things for any Christian is to know what the voice of God is like, and to know what the voice of Satan is like, right? <laughs> and to know what your own inner voice is like. There's three things. Now, what I'm suggesting is hopefully you know the voice of Satan and you can you can ignore that one, but what we want is that our lives would develop so much that the voice of God and, the, and our voice are, are very similar as we grow more and more into the mind of Christ. And so here's some things to test your impression. So if you come up with some idea, you know, here's a question. Does it agree with the Bible? Obviously, if you come up with some great idea about what you're going to do and it's against the Bible, then I would suggest don't do that. Okay, number two, does it make me more like Christ? If you adopt some theological principle that turns you into a mean-spirited, hateful person, then I would suggest something is wrong there, okay? Number three, does my church family confirm it? That's a good question to ask. If you come up with some harebrained idea and start announcing to everybody that God told you that Jesus is coming back next Thursday at 3.33 Central Daylight Time, um, you might want to check with some people and say, you know, I've had this vision and that Jesus, I know exactly when Jesus is coming back. Do you think I ought to go and promote that idea? And I'll bet some people will be happy to share their input <laughs> on that particular decision, okay? Number four, is it consistent with how God has gifted me? Is it consistent with your gifts? If you decide that God's calling you to become a rock star, but you have absolutely no musical talent, maybe you ought to rethink things more along the lines of your gifts. Number five, does it concern my responsibility? And so you, you've probably heard this kind of thing a lot. You know, somebody come up and say, well, God told me to tell you that you need to get your act together, okay? <laughs> See, now you're talking about another person's responsibility. A question is, and sometimes God does tell us something about someone else's responsibility, but mostly God speaks to us about our responsibility. What is my responsibility in this situation? And number six, do I sense God's peace about it? And I think that's a good one. I hear that a lot. People I, I, from, from strong Christians, they'll say, you know, I struggled with this decision for a long time, but finally I decided on this, and I just... I just finally developed a sense of peace about it that, that uh, this is what, you know, God's plan is for me. Um, I remember um, when we were up in Victoria uh, helping with the church plant uh, in, in Victoria, Canada, Ashley Austin, um, he, he will go around and say, you know, God told me to plant a church. And he would, he would use that term all the time, which is great. God did tell him to plant a church up there. 
But when you hear his story, you realize it took 12 years for him to get to the conclusion that God told him to plant a church. It wasn't just like he heard a voice or saw the burning bush. He made like 10 mission trips to Victoria to help out with various situations. And all 10 of those were kind of part of the process of God calling him to plant a church. And so when people use that kind of language, don't feel like, well, God doesn't tell me stuff like that. Don't, don't feel like you're a second-class citizen in the kingdom of heaven. Just realize that God speaks to people in different ways. And sometimes people communicate their story in a way that sounds like it was instantaneous or a, a verbal voice from God when really it was a long process of decision-making and weighing the odds and trying to figure out what is the best thing to do. And they finally come to the conclusion, God told me to do this. All righty, let's look at point number two. He gives us the spirit of adoption. Number two, he gives us the spirit of adoption. We talked about how he leads us. Now, let's talk about the spirit, that is, how we feel like we're a part of the family. In the Old Testament, God declared himself by the covenant name, I Am. And this name was designed to inspire awe and humility as they stood before the mystery of the Almighty God. The, the word I am did not communicate God's relationship to his children, but it stated who he was, who he is. And so in the essence of their understanding of God in the Old Testament, it was about the holiness of God, the fear of God, recognizing your smallness before uh, the deity, confessing your sins, seeking mercy, all those. But in the New Testament, while Jesus doesn't change the picture of God's holiness, what he does is he adds relationship. He adds relationship to the picture, that is, as a father to a child. I am was the covenant name of God in the Old Testament. But when Jesus called on God, he, he didn't call him I am. He called him father or dad. In verses 15 and 16, Paul wrote it this way. He said, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now we are invited to come up close to the Lord like a child sits in the lap of a parent. And when I had my own children... That's when I really began to understand the love of the Heavenly Father. And that probably happened to you as well. And if God has a refrigerator, he's got your picture on his fridge, okay? And if God has a wallet, he's carrying your picture around in it. And if God has an iPhone, the wallpaper on the home screen, that's your picture right there because he's crazy about you. Just like you're crazy about your kids and crazy about grandkids. That's just the way parents are. Jesus wanted us to know that's the relationship that we have with the Father, the spirit of adoption. Well, let's look at number three. This is an interesting one. He helps us live out our faith. He helps us live out our faith. Now, this concept is really kind of central to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, it's called the paraclete, in the New Testament, paraclete called alongside to help. And, and so that's, that's his name, the one called alongside to help. Um, and so let's look at verses 22 to 26. It says this, And we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we await our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies, that is our final sonship in heaven. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Like, like, who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. He helps us. That's the word. It's a rare word in the New Testament. It's only used one other time, and that's when Mary and Martha came to Jesus. Remember? And Martha said, Jesus, tell her to help me in the kitchen. Okay, that's, that's the only other time this word is used. Now, we're not told um, that the Holy Spirit will do everything for us because he's given us a mind with which to think and a will with which to decide. But we're told that the Holy Spirit helps us in the path. Now, this word help 
is three conjoined words in the original Greek, which are translated to help. But when I looked this word up one time, I, did, I realized, wow, this is like this big old word, you know, this long. And it's just translated help. It seemed like it was too simplistic a translation for such a complex word. So breaking it down, it starts with S-U-N, soon, which means synchronize, or could be related to the word synchronize in English, which means together. And auntie, which means reciprocally, with each one doing its part, pulling its own weight. And then lambanatai, which means to take hold of. So it's like the Holy Spirit and you together take hold of something together and each do your part, each pull your weight. And this, this, this story of this word really helped me because this is something I've struggled with. My whole life is trying to figure out, okay, what's my part? What's the Holy Spirit's part? How do we work together? You know, that sort of thing. And so this word, uh, it really communicated to me. You take hold of something and you go for it and you do your best and the Holy Spirit is, is, is empowering you and working alongside of you. Dwight Pentecost told this story that years ago, back in the old days, uh, a guy went to a farm and he saw that the farmer was, was pulling his plow with a giant ox and then a smaller bull, kind of like a, a new bull, just a, a few months old. And he said, isn't that kind of weird having two such uh, imbalanced uh, team pulling your, your plow? And he said, well, actually the ox is pulling, pretty much pulling all the weight, but um, but the, the young bull, he's just learning how to pull his weight. I thought, that's a pretty good picture of the Holy Spirit working with us, is that he's a lot bigger, and he's pulling a lot more of the weight, but he's helping us along every step of the way. Okay, let's look at number four. Moving along here. Number four, the Spirit inspires our prayer. The Spirit inspires our prayer, because we need help, Right? Now, in the series that we just completed about emotionally healthy discipleship, one of the things that uh, the, book, uh, the books recommended was that we have a time, a two-minute time uh, before our, our prayer time or our Bible study time in the morning, in the midday, and at night, a two-minute time before and after of just listening to God. Well, I really struggled with that. <laughs> I'm struggling with it, but I'm working. I'm getting better. It's really coming along there. And... Um, and we need the Holy Spirit to help us as we pray. It, in verse 26, it says, We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Do you remember that Moses prayed for the wrong thing? He, he prayed that God would let him go over into the promised land after God had already told him not. And God said to him, uh, Do not speak to me anymore about this matter. <laughs> I thought, well, that's kind of blunt, you know. Do not speak to me anymore about this matter. Okay. And remember Paul prayed for something three times that he could get rid of that thorn? And it's kind of like God told him the same thing. Do not speak to me anymore about this matter. But God said, my grace is sufficient. I will help you. And so the Holy Spirit is our advocate in prayer. Like, like they joke about lawyers. Like, you know, there's all these jokes about lawyers, but... They always say, but when you really need one, you're glad you got one, right? Okay, so a lawyer advocates for us in court and to the judge, to the jury, and, and all the paperwork and legal processes of how things go. And so you need that person there to help you. You, you don't really know what to do. You don't know how to handle all that situation. But they do, so they advocate for us. It's saying the Holy Spirit's like an advocate. He's, you, you don't know all the things to do. You don't understand all the processes and all that but the holy spirit does and he'll take care of it for you he will work alongside of you advocating helping encouraging you to pray praying for you when you don't know how to pray the holy spirit helps us pray if you feel like that you're not very good at prayer well guess what the holy spirit is helping you and so god might think hey you're praying great because the holy spirit's helping you you know empowering that feeble little prayer of yours and making it real to the Father. Well, there's one more. One more I want us to look at. And that is number five. He gives me spiritual eyes to see. He gives me spiritual eyes to see. When you were born, you were given um, eyes to see 
and ears to hear. When you were born again, you were given spiritual eyes to see and spiritual ears to understand and to hear spiritual truth. In Ephesians 1, 18 and 19, Paul wrote, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power toward those, for, to us who believe. Paul was praying for the churches. He was saying, this is my prayer for you. I, I'm praying that this would happen for you. And he's also praying for us. He was praying for the churches then and all the churches who would come in the future. He was praying that we could see with spiritual eyes. He was praying that we could know who we are and we could know what God's plans are for us. One of the ways that Paul would describe what spiritual growth is, like what is spiritual growth? Paul would call it spiritual growth is spiritual insight. The ability of your spiritual eyes and ears to be able to understand and comprehend the truth about God. Who we are in Christ, who God is, and who God is making us out to be. So my prayer for you is that you too would gain supernatural spiritual eye, eyes and ears so that you can understand who God is and how the Holy Spirit is helping you every step of the way. Let's pray. Our Father, we recognize, Lord, that we are kind of, to be honest, feeble <laughs> about life, about prayer, about decision-making. We don't always know the right thing to do. But your very Spirit is in us, empowering us every step of the way so that we can fulfill your will, your destiny in our lives on this earth. I pray, Lord, that we would recognize the work of your spirit in our lives because we get to walk with you and love you and be close to you every moment of every day through the power and love of the Holy Spirit. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Hey again, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. I want to let you know about a couple of things before we go. First of all, if you haven't filled out your communication card yet, you can go ahead and do that now and drop it in the container on your way out the door. You can also fill out this same card at bearvalleychurch.com connect. If you have an offering to give today, you can give by cash or check in the container on your way out. You can also give online at bearvalleychurch.com give. Thank you for your generosity. We have some awesome stuff coming up in the life of our church over these next few weeks. Next Sunday is going to be our Spring Fling. This is going to be a great Western-themed carnival that's going to be uh, out back behind our kids' building, and we'll serve food inside the kids' building as well. That's going to be next Sunday from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock. We will have a 10 o'clock family service beforehand if you want to join us for that, and then head outside for all the fun at Spring Fling. We're also having a Spring Fling workday today after the 1115 service to help get ready. Now, it's not just moving big stuff and construction and things like that. You can help get our games ready, uh, lots of stuff that you can do that everybody can be a part of. We would love for you to help at the workday this afternoon, and we are providing lunch. We hope to see you there. Also, in two weeks, it is Easter Sunday, and we cannot wait to celebrate with you. We're going to have our sunrise service at 6.33 a.m. out in the pavilion. Then we'll have our regular worship services at 10 o'clock and 11.15. We have great stuff planned for all of our ministry areas, including a virtual escape room and Easter egg hunts for the kids. We hope that you'll invite your family and friends and join us in two weeks for Easter Sunday. That's all we've got for today. Let's close out our service with some worship. Will you stand with us and let's sing together.
Great day.